we can start mr kavaldeep uh thank you very much uh, everybody for joining us uh, today uh this is a very important session and it's our fifth uh, session in uh, looking at uh, medication errors in high risk situations this is an important subject matter for many reasons uh many of us are now looking at our governments and health systems who are undertaking reviews on what we call lessons learned during covid and that's one big mass cohort of uh, data that's looking at how high risk situations presented ourselves and how we were able to tackle with them and what uh, mistakes were made from a perspective of uh, who uh, a high risk situation evolves uh, in that sometimes it's almost like um, quicksand you think it is quite normal placid but when you start working in that situation things start happening but the telltale signs like all intelligent people and those who are aware is that high risk medication starts the first trigger uh, these are medication whose even smaller doses uh, or overdoses can cause significant harm and especially within the opiate families or medication which when used as directed uh, if not uh, properly assessed patients can lead to some serious uh, patient harm then we've got uh, issues where there are factors which we call patient and provider uh, relationships this might be something within the relationship or how the services are organized how people that transported in and out the what are called transition situations are uh, looking at how information and health literacy is provided how well the health workforce is trained and looking at areas of new development or new departure for instance if it's an old service healthcare services being provided that's fine uh, but if you're bringing in a new radiology machine uh, with new numbers new things then chances are that becomes a high risk situation and then uh, lastly i think within the systems and workers i think it's really about how these are uh, laid out uh, what are the pathways uh, of uh, moving patients what are the arrangements made to take care of patients uh, before or after the in the palliative care situation today uh, we have got uh, an excellent uh, group of speakers with us each of them have got a specialty and have uh, been involved in a certain situation and represent that situation accurately today to show what an high risk situation is and what should be done uh we will start off uh, firstly with uh, from the philippines uh we will take um, dr professor robles uh, professor robles comes uh, from is a dean of uh, pharmacy at the university of manila and professor robles has really looked at the situation as it's uh, going through uh, at the forefront of what i call the delivery end of things which is point of access to many patients uh, there are situations that develop uh, patient harm is likely if that uh, interaction is not um, handled properly and uh, as professor robles has clearly indicated while for preparing for this session it's the role of the pharmacist and almost like a fourth emergency service in that they can prevent uh, serious harm happening the next speaker we have uh, today ankit next is uh, dr craig uh, dr simon craig uh, comes from what we everybody in every health systems i think we know the emergency uh, health services are the most uh, critical and the most high risk situations uh dr craig has worked in a, as an emergency physician at the monash uh, medical center in melbourne he's looking at another very critical aspect i think uh, children's pediatric emergency uh, area and has has been a great author i yesterday managed to uh look into some of um, his works on the emergency medication book for pediatrics and uh 
I've gone ahead and uh, ordered one from uh, uh, our Amazon because I thought it really points out what needs to be done. So Dr. Craig has got a good insight into this. I would suggest everybody look at this uh, book. I think it's an insight that uh, things that we often miss that really we need to know. And I think uh, my lovely subject, I think was uh, his work on uh, uh, asthma here in the London in the UK. I know ethnic minorities um, uh, response are very poor. And uh, I think uh, it makes um, very uh, important to learn this. And very often the outcomes of children being rushed into emergency with asthma are very different. So if it is the main, uh, what they call the host uh, white community, then you will have uh, better outcomes than any immigrant group of uh, children. Same age, same factors. So asthma is one of those uh, highest uh, uh, risk situations. Next, uh, please, uh, Arkit. Next speaker, I think Professor Vinieri uh, has been again coming from the surgery side now. I think this is, uh, again, we were all saying that how fortunate we are having uh, Professor Vinieri here because very often we miss this uh, opportunity to discuss uh, the most high risk situation, which is the surgery situation. Again, um, Dr. Veneri has trained very well in many uh, health systems, and he has actually worked in New York and uh, seen how things work in this. As you know, in New York City is uh, where it's almost like emergency medicine and sometimes and even in routine care. Uh, it's so such a uh, under, undertaking. Again, from the uh, point of view of uh, gastrointestinal endoscopy, I think for my as a colorectal patient, I think I, I always uh, said that uh, these are issues, misdiagnosis uh, for any endoscopy that you do is very important. I think this is an error that is a high risk that if you miss things out, you're putting at risk uh, patients. And again, Professor Veneri has got a very good insight uh, into issues generally. And uh, today I'm very grateful for him because he's on his uh, vacation and he's really given us this time to join us from the Dolomites with us. Uh, we wouldn't keep you long from your family and friends on your vacation, uh, Professor Veneri. Uh, next, uh, Ankit. And now, uh, Professor Galapathy. Uh, as you know, uh, Professor Galapathy. Uh, again, is well uh, trained. Uh, she's been in our, our London and Wales, um, where uh, she knows very well the situation between um, England and Wales, the situation of uh, different uh, scenarios. Again, Professor Galpati uh, has held the chair of uh, pharmacology and humanities at the University of Columbia, uh, uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, we all know what is going on right there now, as you know, shortage of medicines, uh, shortage of uh, healthcare products. And uh, whilst that was, that is not Dr. Galapati's subject matter, but we do feel for her needs and her country's needs and fellow patients in there. It's very important to recognize this and uh, Professor Galapati brings it that insight uh, into low and middle income countries. And now I suppose in now, by, by, by accident and also very important for us is um, high risk situation, which is national emergency uh, within uh, conflict. And then, uh, okay, next. Thank you very much. So without much ado, I would first ask uh, uh, Dr. Robles from Philippines to start us off uh, on this um, uh, dis discussion. Dr. Robles, over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Semi. And uh, tonight, I would like to greet each one of you. A, it's, it's an evening here in the Philippines, but I think I should be greeting you good morning, good afternoon mm -hmm. from all over the world. And uh, in, on behalf of the Federation of Asian Pharmaceutical Associations, I'm happy to give my share of the discussion on medication um, factors. Um, 
medication factors um, in high risk situations. So let me share my slides with you. Okay. So uh, let me give a brief background. All medicines, regardless of those dosage form and route of administration, administration carry with them relative risk. If you look at a product insert that's in a box of a medicine, you will find that there's a list of adverse effects and they are even longer than the indication or beneficial effects. Well, that sums up the different experiences that people who use the medicine had encountered through, uh, uh, during, the, during their uh, use of that medicine. However, among the medicines made available to patients, um, there are those which will cause undue harm when used improperly. These are called high alert medications. Now, these are medications or drugs that bear a heightened risk of causing significant patient harm when they are used in error. So I think I have to qualify um, the whole definition with the last word, when they are used in error. Now, if we take a look at the different adverse drug reactions, actually they vary. Some of them are uh, mild symptoms, some are severe symptoms, and some will require emergency uh, treatment such as anaphylaxis symptoms. And therefore, uh, these are experiences of patients when they are using drugs, even uh, at doses normally used in men. So some are being used for prophylaxis, some for diagnosis or therapy of disease, or for modification of physiological function. Now, um, I have looked at a study by the WHO ADR BG base, which is uh, at the Uppsala Monitoring Center, and they were able to gather about 3,013,074 ADRs wor worldwide from the period 2000 to 2009. And they were able to classify it. 16% were serious. 60% were reported for females. And they also recognized that high-income countries have higher ADR reporting compared to low-income countries. Now, don't be deceived by this, uh, that uh, low-income countries are not experiencing adverse drug reactions. It's just that in high-income countries, they have bet better monitoring systems, and therefore, they were able to document um, the uh, patient experiences with medicine. Overall, Majority of ADRs were reported for central nervous systems, followed by cardiovascular medicines. But uh, of the reports coming from low-income countries, they have seen that there are more ADRs for anti-infectives. Well, this is understandable given that the predominant diseases in these countries are mostly of infectious nature. In high-income countries, they have more ADRs from anti-neoplastic agents and immunomodulating agents. Now, we can also take a look at, look at it at the national level, such as the one, um, the statistics of U.S. on ADRs. Like in 2020, adverse drug events cause approximately 1.3 million emergency departments visit each year and about 350,000 patients each year need to be hospitalized for further treatment after emergency visits for adverse drug events. We also have to realize that older, the older people get, the more medicines they take, and the occurrence of adverse drug reaction increase. With this statistics, I would like to convince you that the problem with ADR is real. I am not yet touching on high, high risk uh, medications here. And um, when we classify ADRs, uh, they are classified into six types. And uh, they are, these are the ones we teach our pharmacy students. Uh, A is augmented, B, bizarre, which is also idiosyncratic, which is uh, 
non-dose related. It's a uh, unique to an individual. And uh, chronic, which is uh, dose related and time related because the person is taking the medicine over a long period of time. And there are also ADRs that uh, may not appear at the start of, uh, of taking the medication, but they will appear at a later time. Well, this is because some medicines are accumulated in the body and it takes time before the adverse reaction um, occur. And we also have the end of use uh, ADR, which is withdrawal. And I think this happens when, um, for example, like we have the steroids. Um, they cannot just be stopped. There should be a tapering of doses uh, so that the person taking it will not experience withdrawal symptoms. And lastly is failure of therapy, which is the inability of the medicine to deliver the expected uh, e effect. Now let us uh, focus on high alert medicines. I think you, uh, you have remembered from my first slide that uh, I said that with medicines, there is always that relative risk. And uh, when we say high risk, uh, these are those that are already known to have caused uh, serious effects when they are used improperly. And I have provided the examples here. We have the anti-infectives and the examples provided here are mostly antibiotics that are used for severe infection. And then we have uh, potassium and other electrolytes. They may seem harmless in the sense that it's only potassium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, etc. Excuse me. Um, but again, if they are used uh, in not in the right uh, quantity or um, volume, there is a possibility that the person will experience adverse reaction. And in here, I have added, um, I have included insulin. And uh, all insulins are capable to become high risk. Okay. And then we have the narcotics. <laughs> Excuse me. The narcotics and other sedatives, which I think is um, known to most of us with regards to their um, addic addicting property and uh, also um, withdrawal symptoms. And then we have the chemotherapeutic agents, and they are very potent medicines because they can kill cells. And therefore, if they are used improperly, there's a possibility that uh, the effect will be really felt by the person, but this is more on the adverse effects. And then we have heparin and the anticoagulants. Now, heparin is uh, for blood thinning, and this usually are given for people who um, develop uh, thromboembolism or those who had myocardial infarction or heart attack. And therefore, um, they have to be used um, properly in the sense that they can thin the blood so much that it can also result to hemorrhage. So this is very important. And there are those uh, which are locally identified. They may not be considered very uh, dangerous, and yet, if they are misused, they can also um, present problems to the patient. Now, there are statistics on ADR of high alert medicines, and you could see here that antibiotics um, in the period uh, 2013 to 2014, this is uh, on the record of CDC, USCDC uh, Medication Safety Program, uh, antibiotics are responsible for almost one in six. So that's about 16% uh, estimated emergency department visits for ADEs. They are also involved in more emergency departments uh, than any other class of drugs in patients under 50 years of age. You will notice that in children five or younger, antibiotics can also cause more than half, about 56% of estimated emergency department visits for ADEs. And about four in five, 82%, um, 
emergency department visits for ADS from antibiotics alone are due to allergic reactions. What about anticoagulants? Now, bleeding from oral anticoagulants resulted in approximately 235,000 emergency department visits. And older adults, uh, that's, uh, that means uh, more than 65 years of age, were involved in approximately 80% of uh, direct oral anticoagulant-related bleeding visits and 77% of warfarin-related bleeding visits. And that's the reason why in some countries, uh, certain pharmacies have their anticoagulation services, which means that they will be able to monitor um, those people who are on this medication. Now, what about insulin? And this is, uh, the record is from uh, 2007 to 2011. Out of 100,000, nearly two thirds of the patients had symptoms of severe hypoglycemia. We have to know that um, the main adverse effect of insulin is hypoglycemia, that is getting too low uh, blood sugar, which will result to shock, seizures, or loss of consciousness. And one third of the emergency department visits resulted in hospitalization. Since we know that um, People who are older uh, are using insulin uh, when they have progress, when their diabetes had progressed, or those with type 1 diabetes, they are more vulnerable to insulin related hypoglycemia. Now, for chemotherapeutic agents, I have uh, I have utilized online discussion forums, and uh, there are about 411 breast cancer patients and the uh, they experienced 473 ADRs, mostly related to nervous and immune systems. So you could see that uh, the adverse effect of chemotherapeutic agents may be different from its intended effect. Now, um, there are other, uh, I would like to mention about uh, the adverse effects of some medicines. I just selected a few because uh, there are so many medicines uh, with data on their adverse effects. The aminoglycosides, which I know our doctors are very much familiar with, um, they may cause damage to hearing or the kidneys in a dose-related uh, drug reaction. We also know that uh, potassium chlorides, if uh, it is uh, used in place of the diluted solution, it may result to fatal outcome due to severe hyperkalemia. And we have to know that potassium and sodium, they are needed in balance in our body, especially the heart, so that there is proper function. But once there is an increase, there will be imbalance, and so the problem will happen. Now, type A reactions associated with opioid uh, medications uh, include nausea, vomiting, constipation. In, in severe cases, respiratory depression or respiratory arrest, which may result to death. Now, uh, it was uh, mentioned that uh, during prescribing or dispensing uh, of uh, methotrexate, uh, errors are committed such that excessive doses are um, either prescribed or dispensed. And this resulted in bone marrow suppression pulmonary complications, and in some cases, even death. How about vitamin K antagonists like warfarin? Uh, so these are more like uh, the oral, the anticoagulants. They are used in the world uh, in the treatment and prevention of thrombosis. But uh, the main type A reaction of these agents is hemorrhage. Now, I decided to include other medicines also considered high alert because uh, Dr. Kenyu mentioned that uh, sometimes we think it is safe and yet it will come to a point that it will become dangerous. Now, I think you are all familiar with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You have ibuprofen, ketoprofen, etc. And these are used for pain associated with inflammation. And um, they become a uh, high alert medication in some circumstances because they also cause gastrointestinal effect. When they are used, for example, um, 
on an empty stomach uh, that actually can um, they can irritate the gastric mucosa which can be uh, the start of a uh, of uh, irritation to bleeding and therefore it can become uh, a big problem okay and it was also implicated for cardiotoxicity uh, such as uh, exacerbation of heart failure worsening of hypertension etc so therefore we cannot just simply say that uh, these pain relievers are okay no nothing wrong can go with it now how about paracetamol um, i know of one advertisement that says it's the safest uh, drug well it may be uh, used in all parts of the world for uh, simple pain but we have to consider that uh, it has been responsible for a high rate of medication errors in children, including several instances of those related liver failure. I have um, also told my students that uh, you cannot use this on a, on a regular uh, regimen for more than 10 days. You know, it, it's because uh, there could be the possibility of having uh, liver uh, damage. How about lithium? Now, lithium is used for me as an antipsychotic uh, medicine. I, I know that this has been replaced by other safer medicines, but still uh, it's being used for uh, mental health problems. And uh, its type A reaction is CNS disturbances and cardiac conduction disturbances. We cannot uh, also um, disregard that allergies to medications can cause high risk situations. And that is why very important for our prescribers and even uh, pharmacists, the dispensers to, to ask a patient or their carer if they are allergic to a certain medication because uh, this can put the life in, of a person in danger if they are allergic to a certain medicine and then take it, then they take it without knowing that it's related to it. I think um, as uh, health professionals, uh, I know you are aware of what we call cross-sensitivity reaction, like people who are sensitive to penicillin may also be sensitive to other beta-lactam uh, antibiotics such as the cephalosporins and uh, the imepinems and also the monobactam. So it's very important for clinicians to ask whether a person has allergy to a certain medication or not, or have a test so that this can be uh, ruled out. Now, can ABRs from high alert medicines uh, be prevented? Because I think I have painted a grim picture with what I have presented to you. Well, we, we also have to realize that medication errors increase with increase in number of medications, number of providers, and number of care settings, and also levels of care because we know that uh, medicines are being uh, handled by different uh, health professionals in the, uh, in the system. So you could see here that it's the prescriber who evaluate the patient and establish the need for the medicine and then select the right medicine, but also uh, should be determining also interactions and allergies before prescribing a medicine. Then in a hospital setting, you have a transcriber. It could be a nurse or another personnel that transcribes the pre prescription. And sometimes even here, the transcription uh, may be changed. And therefore, very important that accuracy is maintained at this level. And then we have the pharmacist. And the pharmacist also has uh, something to do with the uh, the review of the prescription order and uh, also need to consult with the physician when it comes to uh, discrepancies. The administration that goes with the nurse in the ward and the monitoring should be handled by all the different health professionals. Now, there are potential actions to reduce medication-related uh, uh, ADRs harm due to medication factors and another 
first is computation of appropriate dose. Now, uh, doctors nowadays do not compute for every dose or every drug, but there are certain drugs, especially high alert medicines that will require uh, accurate computation based on the weight of the person, such as aminoglycosides. And very important that uh, there is uh, segregation of storage areas for different formulations of the drug. Mm -hmm. There was a time in the Philippines where hospital pharmacies really clamored for the pharmaceutical industry to make a big difference on how they label their products, especially if it's the same uh, generic uh, generic name, but different doses. Because if they look alike, the more problem there is when it uh, when they are getting the medicine from the shelf. Dr. Robles. Um... I hope you can conclude soon. I'm so yeah. absorbed with this. I uh, almost forgot to keep time on this. So, so grateful, such a beautiful presentation. But could you conclude and we'll take it in slides later. Thank you very much. Okay. So yes, so there are many things that can be uh, done in order to reduce medication-related harm. So it doesn't involve, it is system-related system, uh, system related and it involves uh, different health professions. And therefore, I have uh, included here many things which can be useful for us to really reduce the harm from high alert medicine. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope that we can achieve the patient goal to improve the safety of high alert medicine. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Robert, uh, Dr. Robles. Uh, also to the participants who are joining us, We'll make sure some of these findings are shared with you. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the presentation. It was such a fascinating presentation. And I think uh, Dr. Robles has set the scene now. Uh, Dr. Simon Craig, uh, let's uh, hear your insight. I think, as I said, it's something that we all feel for and it's all important. And I says in Asia Pacific region, especially where family and children are important, uh, children's health becomes absolutely critical. Thank you much, uh, Dr. Craig, over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. We'll be speaking really about provider and patient factors in high risk situations. Uh, there are a number of provider factors which can impact uh, the safety and prescribing medication. These include a prescriber or a provider who is inexperienced, who is inattentive, who is rushed or distracted, who is stressed, or in a mental health issue such as depression. And, so, and it's clear that workload can impact on a number of these things, either you know, due to resourcing or too many uh, competing priorities. Some tasks are intrinsically prone to error. These include tasks that are unfamiliar to the operator, performed under pressure, involve calculation of dosages, or involve dilution of medications. And there are certain high-risk situations which are recognised. Uh, nursing staff bear the brunt of most uh, medication errors because they're the ones at the bedside delivering those. Uh, it, it's been noted that orthopaedic surgeons are probably at higher risk than uh, some other specialists in terms of uh, medication errors. And there are additional complexities in people who are critically ill, so intensive care units, or people that require weight-based dose, dosing, such as uh, in paediatrics. So you can imagine that an emergency situation in a child sort of crosses over between critical illness, weight-based dosing, and nursing staff with multiple competing priorities. It's also recognized that high-risk situations may extend to resource limitations, uh, whether that is uh, in primary health care, pre-hospital care, uh, where there's a limited formulary, or where there's extrinsic things like disasters or floods or conflict, which is uh, making uh, the standard to the risk of healthcare much more challenging. In addition, there may be limited options or unfamiliar medications or equipment or different things to what you're used to. Communication is another important aspect, particularly in the sort of the critical setting or the, the acute setting. Uh, in an emergency situation, most things are done through verbal orders. Written orders must be legible. And computer order entry, which is uh, becoming more popular in uh, uh, high-income countries, there are medications which look alike or uh, 
uh, seem like, or you, you task, type the first few letters, and then it can auto-complete something that you weren't quite uh, anticipating. So metronidazole or methotrexate uh, or metoclopramide all start with MET. So there are risks for those sorts of things. And then there's also uh, issues of communication between healthcare providers and the patients, you know, such as language barriers or comprehension. Uh, and with regards to patients uh, being at risk of medications, those that are very young or very old, those of an unknown weight, those with language or communication difficulties, as we've just mentioned, those with poor health literacy or those who are unsure of their own medication history, and, and those with organ dysfunction, all already increased risk of uh, something going wrong. Just want to walk you through an example that uh, happened in our hospital a number of years ago now. It was night shift. There were junior medical staff uh, working in the paediatric emergency department. There was no warning, but an unexpected, critically ill child arrived. It was determined fairly rapidly that it was an infant, who was a few months old, was shocked. And as part of the treatment, uh, urgent intubation was required. The family were filming everything that was going on uh, on their phone during the resuscitation. There was lots of expressed emotion and various things, and people were very stressed. We had thought we'd done a great job in our department. We had these lovely charts which suggested that, you know, what you needed to give and how many milligrams per kilo you would do and how much, how would you dilute it and how much you would infuse it over. And we had one for the bolus doses and one for the infusions that you would make up when someone would be stable. The wrong chart was used. A bolus dose of medication was given, but it was the medication that was actually intended for a whole infusion's worth of medication. So the child received a large bolus, which resulted in cardiac arrest. Fortunately, the child did recover from that incident. However, reviewing the case uh, did lead us to reflect on how we usually manage the, the resuscitation of a child rapid calculations of weights, drugs, scribbled on a whiteboard or an x-ray box somewhere, uh, done in a hurry with incomplete medic uh, in information. And reflecting, is this the best we can do? And how can we stop what had happened that night from happening again? There are existing medication dosing uh, advisors, things like the Broslow tape, and there's, uh, there's an example from uh, Germany, and there's, there's other uh, things around which you can roll out and you sort of get a length-based estimate of the child's weight and some recommendations on the doses. And the drug dose is one piece of the puzzle. However, even in this situation, how do you dilute it? How do you draw it up and what volume is needed are all additional steps which pose risk, particularly in a time pressured situation. We tried a few things. We, we went back and forth. We started with various uh, opportunities and uh, endeavors and eventually ended up with uh, what I presented here, the Pediatric Emergency Medication Book. We're now in our second edition. But basically the premise is that you open up the page for a four kilogram child or a 15 kilogram child, and everything is laid out. You know the drug, you know the dose, you know how the dilution, and you know the volume, and it's all spilled out. It is, is presented in a sort of a logical uh, order, such that you know, anticonvulsants are grouped in one place, uh, intubation drugs are grouped in another place, uh, cardiac arrest, adrenaline, whatever. It's all sort of laid out in a simple, repeatable manner. We've uh, been doing this for a number of years now. Uh, it's been adopted by APLS Australia, so Advanced Pediatric Life Support Australians incorporated to some of their courses. Uh, in recent years, I've been collaborating with Professor Indamathi Santhanam, uh, if, who has led uh, the, the development of pediatric resuscitation emergency medical units in uh, Tamil Nadu in uh, India. And we have recently, uh, with collaborations from a pharmacist where I work, uh, uh, Nicole Dunbauer at Monash, uh, developed a pediatric emergency medication book in India. Uh, the reasons for the differences are there are differences in uh, availability of medications. There are differences in the things that come through the door. So imposing an Australian book in an Indian context didn't really make sense. 
the, the concept is very similar in that we've laid it out in a similar way with similar groupings of medications, but we, we have improved upon the initial thing and, and with a fairly high rate of poisonings and things like that in um, India, uh, we, we've got uh, management of organophosphates, for example, we've got uh, suggestions for management of scorpion skins, we've got antibiotics, which are, you know, infectious disease poses a higher burden over there, the slight differences in the availability of particular anti-seizure medications and so on. So having a localised resource is very important. In a primary care setting, uh, I'm married to a general practitioner, uh, Dr. Kiri Lee Ellerton, and we've come up with a doctor's bag companion design for the primary care setting, such as general practice. The repertoire uh, for medications is much less. Uh, benzodiazepines are pretty much all that's available for seizures, but provides recommendations for buccal or intramuscular or intravenous treatment, uh, provides information for asthma and, you know, basic but effective uh, treatments available, recommends compression ventilation ratios, for example, for CPR. So again, context is, is very much an important part of what this is. Uh, recently, we had the International Conference for Emergency Medicine, and uh, some of my colleagues provided some books to uh, some of their colleagues who uh, work in Fiji. And this was put up on social media uh, not so long ago, uh, where they've actually uh, found a desk and managed to secure it in a way that it won't go missing anytime soon. And again, it's a design so you can open it up, last flat, and you can work your resuscitation off that. And uh, we've seen this in, in various places. People are quite happy to hang onto the books or hang them off the engine trolleys and so on. The key to this is that it's available at the point of care. So where your drug trolley is, the book is, and you can work off it at the time. You don't have to know the weight of the child. If you know the weight of the child, you don't have to think and worry about all those calculations. You can just uh, make sure that it's been given safely, but rely on the calculations that have been done already. Next things we're working towards is just continuing to improve what we're doing. And I'm hoping uh, in the coming months to have an app, which prototypes are available here, but again, you select the weight, you select the, uh, the issue that you're wanting to treat, and then it provides specific advice. However, in my mind, having the hands-on book that's there in front for the nurses to see, the doctors to trust that the nurses have got is probably safer than someone reading things off their phone that no one else can access. So uh, having a, a physical thing, which is endorsed by a hospital, uh, physically present at the point of care, and it, it can be electronic versions as well, but the fact that it's on the drug trolley where you're drawing up things about what the action is and right at the bedside is the critical thing that's made a difference here. So in summary, there are a number of provider factors uh, that we've touched on. There are a number of patient factors that we've touched on. Some of these are not modifiable. However, you cannot remove all of the stress of a paediatric resuscitation, but we can make things safer by having point of care resources which are appropriate and tailored to the, the clinical setting where you're at. We've pre calculated doses, dilutions, and volumes, which then remove some of the stress and difficulties with uh, ongoing uh, resuscitation and provides confidence to the team. Clear instructions for administration are also very important. I will stop there and allow the next speaker to continue. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Craig. I think that's very brilliant. I think it's uh, helped us achieve what we wanted to see, that you have a situation developing where you have an unconscious child on your table. What do you do? How do you calculate things? I think you've given us that insight onto tools we can adopt but also try to prevent those errors happening. I think uh, this is something we are all calling out. Uh, we're actually learning uh, our national review that's going on in COVID issue, uh, situations is pointing out to some of these issues that we must have uh, the systems in place that yes, errors will, um, or, or the uh, unsafe environment will be created because if it's 4 a.m. at night and you've got 20 people waiting there, only two people in the front line of the emergency department, then uh, there's likelihood of things could happen and to have systems in place that could uh, take those, well, that's very important for us. Uh, 
We'll ask you questions later. There were lots of questions coming in through from our systems, but we'll put them at the end, uh, as I said. Uh, now, could I now ask um, our next speaker? So it's very important for us to now uh, go to the uh, Professor Venieri's uh, insights. And as yes. I said, uh, where we have looked at uh, Dr. Craig's and also do Dr. Robles setting the scene now, Professor Venieri will now look at a special set of conditions. I think this is where you know that uh, no one human is the same. You know? that it's not like uh, car mechanics, that if someone car comes to you and it needs this or that replaced or done or taken out, uh, then it's a standard uh, machinery in there. We never know what's happening inside until we open it up, as somebody said. <laughs> and even when you do open up the human being, we just don't know what's going on and there's likelihood of great error. And Professor Vanderi knows that very well and then he has really good insight in this. Professor Vanderi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the organization for uh, involving me in this uh, webinar. And I appreciate and honor to be with many, many respectable guests and colleagues. Well, my actual focus is on ergonomics and the human factors approach. Next slide, please. Well, um, of course, there are drivers for human factors in, uh, in managing safety and risk, mainly in healthcare situations. For example, commitment, cognificence, and competence. So we have to work on a proactive uh, approach. Would this be possible in, uh, in, in medicine, in healthcare? Next slide, please. Of course, as we've seen before from uh, Dr. Craig, he told us there the framework of patients and providers, but may I also introduce process and technology besides people? So this is the ergonomic approach to safety. I mean, you have to provide uh, proactively, understand where the healthcare worker will be uh, working, where his workplace should be, and in medication, safety. We cannot allow to have, let's say, a non-defined area of work. Next slide, please. So uh, it's important that we, or at least myself, being a risk manager, I have to work on a risk assessment approach. What does that mean? That means that I have to identify the hazards, identify who is at risk. And let me say that the patient is not only at risk, but also the healthcare professional is at risk. Because let's not forget that when an adverse event occurs, when an error occurs in medicine and does harm to the patient, there is also a second victim. And the second victim is the healthcare professional. Then we have to assess the level of hazards. We have to put in controls. We have to reorganize and reproject our healthcare standards document all that we have to do and then continue our risk assessment approach. Next slide, please. And it's important that we understand the root causes of medication errors. For example, you already, you already spoke, Dr. Craig spoke about the communication, the lack of inadequate and clear communication among doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and why not the patients themselves? Eligible and incomplete prescriptions. I'm, I'm very worried about the incomplete prescriptions. Multiple drugs, and we have to know that now reconciliation of drug factors, which is an ergonomic approach to medication safety should be done. And as uh, Dr. Rubble sort of told us before, look alike and sound alike drugs, and why not also drugs that the pharmaceutical industry still enables to produce the same labeling and maybe the same packaging. How many years have to still go by until the pharmaceutical industry understands these problems on the sharp end of our, of our profession? Next slide, please. And what about the working conditions that facilitate medication errors? High noise levels were always continuously interrupted. And now the argument is also excessive workloads due to maybe uh, staffing shortages. Now in Italy, we're going through a medical profession crisis. 
We don't have any doctors and nurses anymore. So we have to try and uh, invent new solutions in the future. For example, trying to motivate uh, students to become uh, nurses and doctors in the future. High turnover. And of course, the medication administration protocols, because protocols, when they're so rigid on an ergonomic and cognitive basis, they can lead to errors. Environmental factors that could affect the performances, for example, distractions and interruptions. May I say that I conducted personally a study on interruptions in nursing in, 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 the, in, the, in the ward, and nurses were mainly disrupted majorly by their own colleagues and by doctors, whereas the family members or the patients were not at all the major disturbance. Transporting patients from different settings, also the transfer of, per, of patients from high dependency levels, maybe to even low dependency levels, could be also uh, environmental factors. And of course, performing ancillary services, such as uh, using more other products that could, uh, that could, uh, that could lead to medication, medication errors. Next slide, please. So what about storage? Uh, I think Dr. Fabbles, Rubbles said, mentioned that at the beginning. So where should we put the medications? And this should be one of the basic goals when we start to project a new hospital, when we start building a new hospital, when we put the blueprints of what should be the exact layout of, uh, of, of a ward and where maybe the uh, medication storages should be allocated. And sometimes uh, a few little uh, minor conditions could help uh, to understand that medication storage is as important as medication prescription or as medication errors in, in, in general. Uh, I usually say to my nurses in the ward, well, if you have the same refrigerator as medications, don't put any food in there. Just keep it for the medications and all. Again, next slide, please. So I figured out that there could be 10 strategies to reduce medications errors on an ergonomics and human factors approach. First of all, minimize clutter and keep the workplace clean. I like to, well, in my hospital, I, I, I took uh, photos and pictures of many working places. And I said, I may, I want to know which ones are cleaner than others, but not on a on a contextual basis. I would just like to say that keeping a workplace clean might be of support to the medical, uh, to the healthcare profession. Verify orders and prescriptions. Probably help technology to become barriers, but be careful and excessive use of technology can also in, be inclined to uh, make errors. So for example, the use of barcodes would help. Be aware of the LASA drugs and identify a place which is sure for handling a storage. Well, let me say a double check procedure should not uh, be uh, should not be overestimated. Uh, having a few pair of eyes would help. Design effective warning system, for example, signs, signals, posters, alerts, uh, based on a human factors approach. For example, I like very much what Dr. Craig mentioned about the doctor's companion, the doctor's bag companion. Involve patient and communicate among caregivers. Why not? Let's enforce and empower the patient to help us. Trust your gut. Trustworthiness is fine, but do not exaggerate. If there's something that's not well going, be able to express it. This is called situation awareness, which is a, one of the most important non-technical skills that should be taught to many healthcare professionals during their university per course. Be proactive and do risk assessment evaluations because layouts may change and they could change also according to the healthcare professional's uh, uh, ability to understand and to be a profession. Track medication errors so as to learn from what went wrong. Keep a records. Next slide. Well, Amalberti, who I very know, and he's a researcher, many years ago said that healthcare organizations are compared to be high reliability organizations. Well, my friends, 
are we very, very sure that we are high reliability organizations? Next slide, please. This is our situation. This is what we are day by day. And of course, in medication errors, all this example uh, uh, could help us uh, to harm patients. Next slide, please. So at the end of my presentation, and I hope that my message came clear, what I would like to say is that if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not gonna get there. So be careful, Be uh, uh, consider all at 360 degrees of what our profession can give. And remember, remember that being, we are now doctors and healthcare professionals, but maybe once in our life, we'll be on the other side of healthcare. We might be patients someday. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Veneri. I think your message is uh, brilliant, I think. Uh... Uh, a place for everything and everything in its place is an argument, ergonometrically safe and warm. I like that. And I think um, one, when sees the way surgeons operate, you can see how instruments are laid. And as I said, during our preparation for this webinar, we should always look at uh, a party of surgeons having dinner together. <laughs> the way they handle the cutlery is absolutely beautiful and it's synchronized very safe, you know, pass me this, pass me that. And yes, I, I usually cut my T-bone steak in Florence very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now, uh, without uh, much ado, I think let's go to our next speaker. So I would ask uh, uh, Dr. Galapati to uh, step in and uh, bring us those uh, very important uh, aspects from insights, looking at non middle income countries, uh, looking at uh, medicine within the Australia patient safety overall. And Dr. Galpati has got that unique insight that she's seen what is called walk around the elephant. Um, uh, as, um, as you know, the elephant is sacred in Sri Lanka and it's very important, but she's walked around the elephant of patient safety and she knows every aspect. Over to you, uh, Dr. Galapati. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let me take this opportunity to uh, um, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, speak to you at this important webinar. So I will be talking on uh, medication safety in high risk situations as applicable to the low and middle income countries. And thank you for the concern expressed uh, uh, on our country. And we are going through a difficult period, but, uh, you know, moving on and trying to ensure patient safety, particularly medication safety in the midst of uh, uh, some shortages of medicines, uh, as you quite rightly mentioned earlier on. <clears throat> so I will try to, a uh, uh, lot of uh, things were meant, uh, uh, mentioned by the previous speakers on high risk or high yield medicines. Uh, I will try to uh, speak on uh, particularly uh, focusing on low and middle income countries, particularly uh, with some examples from my own country, uh, the high risk situations virus and the high risk health care systems that we have in low and middle income countries um, and the high risk patients, uh, again, as I said, with some examples. Um, so high-risk medicines have been uh, defined earlier, so in the interest of time, I will move on. Um, so uh, uh, the implication for the low- and middle-income countries pertaining to high-risk uh, uh, or high-alert medicines, the main uh, issue, I think, is to is identifying a list for the, uh, for the particular setting. Um, say, uh, for example, I think uh, several high-income high countries do not, uh, uh, low- and middle-income countries, unlike the high-income countries, do not have a list of uh, uh, high-risk medicines to start off with. For example, we did not have in Sri Lanka and we are now working on developing a, a high-risk medicine uh, medicines list for our country. And when you are developing a list, you need to uh, have a list um, uh, separately for different settings. For example, uh, for the government hospital settings, you need to identify the common medicines involved in serious harm. And the private hospital settings, some of the medicines that are available would be different. So you need to have a separate list for them. And then uh, community settings where dispensaries and, and pharmacies are using another set of medicines medicines and therefore uh, and the availability of brands would be different so therefore when you
you are developing this, you need to uh, you know consider the different settings um, that uh, uh, that are using the medicines in, in your own country. Now, uh, in developing a, or, or updating uh, the list, if you have already got a list, then you need to update it. Uh, and for that, the best uh, way is to uh, use, uh, if you have already got an incident and learning uh, reporting system, because that way, uh, through, through such uh, reporting systems, you can identify uh, the uh, medicines which have been involved in serious uh, harm. Uh, however, if you don't have, then you can uh, think of other methods of, uh, you know, uh, collecting data on high risk medicines for example if there are if there have been uh, serious patient uh, safety incidents or complaints uh, where inquiries have been initiated then you can use those as uh, uh, you know uh, examples of high risk medicines and then we we did surveys among pharmacists to identify the medicines that they have seen in in uh, uh, when used in error and, and causing patient harm uh, to identify some of these and also um, uh, another thing that I used was, uh, you know, we have a diploma in healthcare quality and safety, and I gave an assignment to uh, uh, the trainees, uh, you know, asking them to identify uh, a medicine that was involved uh, in, in, uh, in a serious harm, and then, you know, uh, how preventive actions were taken. So from that also identified, you know, more than 50 uh, high-risk medicines. So uh, this is the, the initially, um, uh, you know, developed, uh, uh, reported from Australia, a PINCHO, which is the acronym used to identify the high risk uh, medicines. Uh, this has been explained in detail. I won't, uh, you know, go into it in detail. So uh, the, the uh, drugs that we have identified, uh, you know, from what I mentioned earlier, again, you can see the, the medicines are almost, uh, you know, uh, the same, similar medicines, uh, you know, antibiotics are there, insulin, narcotics, the chemotherapeutic agents, uh, the anticoagulants, then other neurotherapeutic uh, medicines like in, uh, lithium, carbamazepine, and antiarrhythmics, NSAIDs, you know, all the, and, uh, the muscle relaxants, uh, you know, syntocinone, uh, ergometrine, and so on. So these are medicines which have been identified in other settings as well. So most of the medicines are common. Uh, to most of the uh, settings uh, uh, that we are talking about. Uh, so if you don't have a list, uh, particularly uh, uh, you know, from a low and middle income country, the ISMP list of uh, high risk, uh, high alert medicines, uh, and again, they have for the, this is the one for acute care setting, and then there's one for uh, ambulatory settings as well as, uh, you know, um, community care settings, I think those can be used as the starting point and then uh, can identify the ones, uh, the drugs that are available in each of the uh, countries. Um, so looking at causes of serious errors uh, in, in low and middle income countries, I think this was mentioned by the previous speakers also, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries, still we do not have electronic uh, prescribing uh, in all settings. So therefore, uh, mostly handwritten prescriptions are used and then illegible or unclear handwriting contributes to errors. And particularly with handwritten uh, prescriptions, again, lookalike, sound alike medicines uh, lead to errors. So therefore, those also need to be identified. Um, when you are writing uh, prescriptions uh, by hand, uh, people tend to use a lot of abbreviations, again, to uh, you know, reduce the time taken to uh, write, uh, uh, most probably, and that uh, leads to errors. And then there are so many factors related to healthcare workers because uh, shortage of staff, which was mentioned earlier, uh, inadequate training sometimes, uh, you know, in our uh, you know, private sector, uh, some of the um, uh, people who are, uh, you know, dispensing medicines may, may not be having pharmacy uh, qualifications. They may be, you know, uh, still apprentices or even not having that. So that can, uh, in, that's a serious uh, uh, issue for safety. Uh, and another very important aspect is the poor medication literacy of patients, uh, because patients sometimes do not know even the key information that they need to know about the medicines. I'll come to that in a moment. So this is, uh, you know, in one of the uh, prescription surveys, um, they have identified that nearly half of the uh, prescriptions were uh, were not legible. So this is an example of such a, a prescription. These are not uncommon. Uh, and then uh, we have, of course, uh, in our country, started introducing electronic uh, uh, prescriptions into the government sector. Uh, and uh, uh, so hopefully, if we come out of this situation quickly, we hope to. Uh, 
you know, see this being implemented in most of the sitting uh, uh, hospitals uh, in the coming uh, years. Uh, these are some of the error prone abbreviations that we have noted, uh, you know, that are used in prescriptions and you can see these are, are not at all standard abbreviations and anyone, it's all subject to interpretation. You might interpret, uh, you know, AZT uh, as, uh, uh, you know, azathioprine or azithromycin and then, uh, you know, uh, can lead to a serious harm. Um, uh, 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 so some of my colleagues did this study and they identified that nearly 70% of the prescriptions had uh, at least uh, one error prone abbreviation. So it, the, the use is quite common and that is a, 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 a cause for uh, errors. And um, high risk medicines cause harm because uh, the dose is uh, dose, dose used uh, is is not correct. Uh, so some of the reasons for dose errors would be you know you either using additional or less zeros or mix up of adult and pediatric doses. Uh, Dr. Simon was earlier talking about uh, you know how uh, you need to calculate the doses uh, according to the weights in the children. Um, then prescription mix ups have uh, resulted in uh, errors in doses. So um, uh, one uh, example. Example that that went into an inquiry was uh, you know um, in, in in my country as a theopin um, uh, a patient was prescribed uh, 250 milligrams twice daily instead of 25 milligrams twice daily and the same dose was dispensed and the patient developed a granulocytosis and sepsis and died uh, in, in two weeks because the patient took the same uh, dose as was uh, dispensed. So these are some serious uh, errors. And again, this is a high risk medicine and uh, um, cause um, unfortunately the loss of the life of that patient. Um, so I mentioned that uh, one of the uh, 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 best methods of uh, uh, collecting uh, the list of high risk medicines would be uh, the incident reporting and learning system. So, you can, for example, now UK, you know, they have been uh, collecting uh, almost all high income countries have incident and learning reporting systems. Uh, so uh, there you know what are the uh, medicines that are uh, causing uh, serious harm. Uh, but in low and middle income countries, this type of um, uh, reporting systems are lacking or even uh, even though they are present uh, then uh, reporting rates are quite low uh, so we uh, we have now uh, because we, we, we uh, do not currently have a system we have developed now a form and we have decided to use a two-step process again one form giving only basic information uh, uh, by the reporter and then with the involvement of the healthcare quality and safety unit of the hospital uh, to get the details again this is to to improve the uh, reporting. So these are some of the reporting forms used by our neighboring countries. And uh, you know, this is a form that we have designed and hopefully we try to collect more, uh, get more in, uh, uh, you know, reports uh, in the coming years. Uh, so once you identify the list, uh, you need to uh, you know, make people aware that these are high risk medicines. So these are the standard kind of labeling uh, that is used by countries uh, to identify the high risk medicine so that people are alerted when you take that this is a high risk medicine this can be used uh, uh, you know by uh, the healthcare professionals um, in their hospitals and and settings um, to draw attention to the high risk medicines uh, again i mentioned about the uh, look alike sound alike medicine so um, uh, Look-alike, sound-alike medicines involving high-risk medicines is is a uh, is is one important cause for harm. Now, for example, there was a situation where uh, uh, ranitidine vial was uh, and uh, atracurium vial uh, looked similar, and therefore atracurium, which is a muscle relaxant, was given. Uh, you know, thinking it was um, uh, ranitidine. Fortunately, it happened in an ICU setting, and uh, you know, patient uh, was saved. Uh, so, uh, so uh, similar-looking um, product have to be se uh, stored separately uh, and you know using uh, tall man lettering uh, to prevent uh, this type of serious errors. Uh, these are some of the um, uh, uh, some of the look alike sound alike medicines that uh, we have identified from from our country from our hospital settings and uh, you can see there are several high risk medicines and you can see what can happen if uh, you know carbamazepine or carbimazole is given instead of carbamazepine or vice versa so um, we had a situation where uh, when a patient was uh, prescribed calcium carbonate lithium carbonate was dispensed because it was written as lico3 so uh, 
uh, this type of serious errors occur again uh, with look-alike, sound-alike medicines and use of abbreviations. Uh, not only the uh, names of the medicines, sometimes the doses uh, uh, are similar looking. Here, uh, we, uh, you know, some time ago, we had uh, the three uh, strengths of uh, warfarin uh, available um, as loose tablets in the same color. And then, uh, so our, uh, we uh, brought it to the notice of the regulatory authority, and then it was changed to blister packaging. But again, the blister packaging, uh, when it was taken out from the box, uh, looks similar. Uh, so again, we had to make recommendations uh, uh, to, to change the uh, outer packaging to make it more safer. Another problem that is uh, there in the uh, low and middle income countries is the availability of large number of different brands of the same medicine. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, over 20 brands available and over 100 products registered of our three main uh, uh, commonly prescribed medicines, atovastatin, metformin, and losartan. So uh, when our uh, regulatory authority act was revised, a need clause was brought where uh, now if you have a higher number of medicines registered, you need to provide um, uh, just, justification for ad additional pro uh, product to be registered. So when a lot of uh, 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 medicines are prescribed using the brand name, particularly in the private sector, a lot of room for errors uh, because uh, brand name confusion is quite common. So there are a lot of stakeholders in the low, low and middle income countries who need to uh, take preventive actions. The regulatory authority, I gave some examples. They have to be um, you know, screening for uh, look-alike, sound-alike medicines during registration process. The Ministry of Health can issue circulars uh, pertaining to safe prescribing, dispensing, and also uh, reporting, uh, uh, to use the reporting systems to um, report errors. Um, and then the procurement agencies, like uh, we have the State Pharmaceuticals Corporation and then the medicines importers for the private sector, they can request revisions of labeling to prevent uh, errors between uh, look-alike, sound-alike medicines. And then the focal point for the, the quality and safety uh, of the country, now ours is the Directorate of Healthcare Quality and Safety. So um, we uh, developed the National Action Plan on Medication Safety through the directory. And uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, aspects pertaining to high, uh, the high-risk high medicines given uh, in the National Action Plan. Uh, next is the high risk situations virus. I think this was, uh, you know, dealt in detail. I, they are again common to uh, both high income and low and middle income countries, ICUs, emergency rooms, operating theaters, obstetric units, and so on. So uh, again, similar uh, uh, for all settings. The uh, high risk. Kalapati, yeah. uh, almost on time now. Yeah, yes, I'm finishing in a moment, yeah. So again, a lot of high risk uh, situations, uh, systems are there. Uh, I mentioned this uh, in my previous slides. Um, another more important thing is high risk patients because um, poor medication literacy is an important uh, uh, contributor. They do not know even the names of the medicines uh, and the doses and so on. So uh, these things to be included in the national action plan, which we have done. And finally, these are my take home messages. Uh, we need to have a practice package uh, for high risk or high alert medicines in the uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, develop the high alert medicines list, uh, have labeling, storage, and dispensing, uh, have tall man lettering, use only abbreviation, uh, accepted abbreviations, and uh, particularly educate the uh, prescri prescribers and the patients uh, on the um, medicines that, are, that they are prescribing and uh, using. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Galapati. I think. Uh... I like that practice element of it. I remember at the World Health Assembly uh, in 19, sorry, uh, the 2020, 2017, when things were safe, the WHO had a kind of uh, interactive uh, patient on the table and we were given time to prescribe something and then administer it through pressing buttons. And uh, you wouldn't believe this. Uh, uh, 35 out of the 50 people actually killed the patient. <laughs> Electronically, that is. Yeah. And we know what the pressure is, look alike, uh, sound alike, doses is as well, and you, as I said, prescription errors. Thank you very much uh, for your great uh, insight. 
most of the questions have been answered, I think, with the, within the presentations that are going on. But the team uh, at the back is uh, harvesting those questions and we'll be answering something some by, back through emails. And all I have to now do is thank all the speakers and uh, yourselves who have joined us for this great session. And uh, there is one very honorous uh, position I have to perform here now. I would like you to please uh, help us improve medication safety in Asia Pacific region. I would ask uh, Ankit uh, to present this to you. And for me, all have a nice morning, afternoon, evening, and I will uh, talk to you later. Firstly, Ankit. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Kavalip. And I'm thankful to all the speakers, panelists to present their wonderful presentations and very informative. Uh, uh, welcome all the speak. Uh, well, welcome all the participants to join us. And uh, yeah, uh, I request all the participants to sign this patient safety call to action pledge. Uh, we are asking people, patient, patient advocates, caregivers, all the stakeholders to come together and join this uh, patient safety unite for patient safety campaign. We are asking all the stakeholders to unite for uh, patient safety and by joining uh, and signing this call to action, uh, we are asking your support uh, in this campaign and we will publish your name after signing this call to action here in this and also if you sign through your organization on behalf of your organization, we will uh, post the logo of the organizations here in support of this patient safety campaign. So, and you, uh, from then you can also uh, join this Unite for Patient Safety campaign uh, by following, uh, by join, uh, by following these three simple steps uh, by downloading the campaign material and, uh, and uh, take printout, having a photo of uh, handling this printout in your hands. And then you can uh, make your own poster maker and then you can uh, post on your social media channels and ask lots of lots of your friends to join the campaign. You can also uh, tag uh, IPO Patient Academy for Innovation and Daxuma Health uh, to join this Unite for Patient Safety campaign. Uh, and by, the, by now I'm uh, thankful all of you, uh, all the speakers and panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you and have a great uh, morning, afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.